And it is my pleasure to present our presentation on hacking your biological clock. Our presenter is Mita Singh, who is the section head at the Henry Ford Sleep Disorder Center. Welcome, Mita. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. So athletic performance depends on different variables, right? Uh, the athlete's innate physical ability, uh, their level of fitness, number of um, hours of sleep they've had. You would have learned that if you came to my talk last year. Um, their motivation, their training, their coaching, and I'm going to concentrate on their biological rhythms and how enhancing that can actually help enhance performance. So here is an interesting headline I recently came across. The margin between, of difference between wins and losses is really slim. And I hope to show you how your circadian rhythms and even jet lag can affect you, know, you developing a cold and not performing at your peak performance. So to that end, I have divided this talk into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the science behind sleep and circadian systems. Then I'm going to talk about jet lag in athletes and talk about interventions in which I speak about actual case studies of work that I've done with athletes, professional athletes, before I summarize. Is there an echo? Can somebody help with that? OK. So starting with the science, you know, we live on this rotating rock. And there are cyclical changes in day and night. And over evolution, all organisms have developed these cellular clock mechanisms so that we can anticipate night and day. And what this does is it gives us a competitive advantage and helps us utilize energy more efficiently. In fact, as of today, we know that more than 50% of all our genes and gene functions are driven by your biological clock. Now, in the human beings, your, your main biological clock, it's called the circadian clock, is in your brain. And it is synchronized to the night and day of outside by light and the way it affects melatonin. So very simply, during the day when you're exposed to light, your eye, like your ear, does two things. So you use your ear for hearing as well as for balance. So light goes through your eye and affects your circadian clock or your biological clock, which suppresses the secretion of melatonin, which results in an alerting signal being released by your biological clock. Then at night, in the presence of darkness, melatonin is secreted, and that suppresses that alerting signal. So really, if we know the timing of your melatonin release, we basically know everything, every, the timing of every physiological function. So here are a few characteristics of your biological clock. So the first thing is that these circadian rhythms or these bio rhythms are intrinsic, which means you, you really don't need night and day for these rhythms to occur. If you took the cells out of your biological clock and put it in a petri dish, it would beat, right? And this was observed hundreds of years ago by this French astronomer. He took the heliotrope plant, it's a plant that opens its leaves in daylight and closes it at night. And he noticed, he accidentally left it in a closed cupboard and noticed that it still continues to open and close in the darkness. And in fact, this has been shown in human beings. Kleitman, who's the grandfather of sleep medicine, in the 1930s decided to stay, live for 30 days in the mammoth caves, just to see if you needed the night and day for your circadian rhythms and show that you, the circadian rhythms are intrinsic. They still continue to run. The next thing that your circadian rhythms decide is how your sleep and wake cycle, right? So there are two separate and independent processes that decide how sleepy and alert you are during the day. The first is your homeostatic drive. It's like hunger. The, the, the more time you go by when you don't eat, the hungrier you're going to be. So this is your homeostatic drive. When you wake up in the morning, as the hours of wakefulness accumulate, this is your sleep drive. And then when you fall asleep, you consume it, right? And then in addition to this, separately, your circadian clock secretes an alerting signal. 
So this alerting signal opposes your sleep drive. There is that slight dip in the afternoon in which people are naturally sleepy, which is why 1.30 in the afternoon is a bad time to have any sort of talk. I mean, I can see a couple of people sleeping in the audience, it's not me, it's your circadian rhythms, right? <laughs> and then it, it sort of peaks um, and it opposes it, and then in the presence of melatonin, it dampens. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is this fact. There is one time between three and six in the morning when your circadian alerting signal is minimum. It's at the same time when the body temperature is at its minimum, and it's important to know because it's something that we'll use when we, when we uh, manipulate your biological clock. Now, we do know what this substrate is, right? The longer you're awake, adenosine accumulates in your brain. We know that because the most commonly used drug in the world is the antagonist of, of adenosine, right? Caffeine. And we use it because we, you know, we're, we're trying to combat sleepiness. But the other thing about your circadian clock is that, in fact, if, apart from your master clock, which is in your brain, which is like, it's like a um, conductor for an orchestra, every cell in your body and every physiological function has a circadian rhythm. So there's a time when it peaks and there's a time when it ebbs. Now the only, it's a complicated slide, but the only thing I want you to pay attention to is this. So things like your best coordination, your fastest reaction time, your greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength, they all peak in the evening, between four and seven in the evening. So there is in fact a time where perform, biologically, your perform, athletic performance should peak. And this you know, it coincides with the time when your body temperature is the highest. It's also the time when your joint stiffness as well as pain perception is low. Now, how important is this? Well, so if you look at last 40 years of NFL data, and I'm pretty sure you guys have already seen this, when you look at night games in which there are East versus West Coast matchups, you know, the, the West Coast in nine, at night games are playing at their biological advantage. And in fact, for the last 40 years, the West Coast teams will beat the Las Vegas point spread and win twice as often. So that's a very robust finding, right? And it's been replicated in, um, in the NHL and the NBA. We know that East Coast teams, when they go to the West Coast and they play night games, you're playing at a biological dis disadvantage. You tend to lose more games. In Major League Baseball, we know that, that as the number of time zones uh, that you cross increase, the chances of winning go down. And in fact, there was a study, this, this, was, this came out a couple of years ago, last year, looked at 20 years of Major League Baseball data, and what they found is that East Coast teams, when they've gone to the West Coast and stayed there, they've played their stint and they come back, they're now jet lagged and out of sync with their own home team at their home time zone. So they tend to lose that first game because they're jet lagged and they, f they lose home field advantage when that happens. Okay, so the other thing, and that's the final thing that's, um, about your uh, circadian clock, what it decides is what your chronotype is, whether you're a morning person or you're a night owl, right? This is intrinsically driven. This is something that's biological. Now, it's, sometimes it's difficult to tell because, because, you know, the time we go to bed and what the time we wake up really depends on our work schedule and social obligations. And remember how light has a very profound effect on your biological clock. And with the invention of the LED, which is present in all the backlit handheld devices which we take to bed, it does a number on our sleep, right? But we can, we can do an experiment. If you, if you aren't taking medications, and you didn't have to be anywhere else in the morning. How many of you, raise your hands if you go to bed, if you'd fall asleep between nine and 10? Okay, 10 to 11? 11 to 12? How about midnight to one? How about one to two in the morning? Two to three? Beyond 3 a.m.? Anybody who goes to bed after one o'clock, raise your hands. Look at each other and wave, you're the night owls in this crowd. So as you can see, there's variability in the time you go to bed, in your biological clock, the way you're wired, right? And so like I said, it's very difficult to treat. This is something that's intrinsic. In fact, you've inherited this 
which means that it doesn't matter how far you go away from home, your parents still decide what time you go to bed <laughs> because it is genetic. Okay, so why is that important? Because remember how I said peak performance occurs between four and seven in the, at night? Well, I sort of lied because this is, this is a study, um, they looked at competition level athletes and they looked at performance at seven in the morning, 10, one o'clock, 4 p.m., 7 p.m., and 10 p.m. And yes, as a group, they did peak between four and seven. But when you divided these athletes into groups of early morning, late night owls, and intermediate chronotypes, well, night owls peak later during the day. Morning people peak earlier during the day. So that's something important because you know, team performance is only as good as the athletic, the individual athletes and how they perform. So, so that was the science bit. So let's talk about jet lag in athletes. We know athletes often travel, they cross time zones, and when they travel, they often play immediately after coming to the new time zone. And jet lag happens when you, when you travel and cross three or more time zones rapidly. So if you take a jet to get to your new destination, your biological clocks are then lag behind. So your rhythm is now out of sync with the new time zone. And this results in multiple symptoms. So it can, you can have difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep at the new time zone. You can, ha you can be sleepy and tired when you're expected to be awake. Um, you can feel, um, you know, sometimes the folks are dizzy. They may have difficult, difficulty concentrating. Uh, they may not have, you know, they may feel amotivated. So mental as well as physical performance is reduced, and you might have stomach uh, complaints. So it's, it's important to address jet lag in, fat, in athletes because obviously it affects performance. So, so you know, when I, when I work with um, athletes and I'm trying to, or teams, and trying, trying to address jet lag, my goals are simple. The first goal is to help resynchronize these biological rhythms to the new time zones and do it as seamlessly as possible. And secondly, correct that misalignment of body peak performance time to the new local performance times. So um, here, you know, again, this is a complicated site, but I think, um, so, so the way that you shift your, biologic, bi your biological clock is really very simple. There are only two things that, that are most effective light and melatonin, right? Because that's, that, that's what any, um, um, shifts clocks. So light in the morning will make you go to bed early and shift your clock in, you know, will, um, will advance your, your biologic clock. While light at night will make you go be to bed later and will delay your biological clock. Now, I'm not gonna spend very much time on melatonin because people always have a lot of questions. Happy to answer them afterwards. But melatonin, as you remember, profoundly affects your biological clock. So you can take exogenous melatonin. Melatonin works the same way as light, but in the opposite direction. If you take melatonin at night, you go to bed earlier. You take it in the morning, you go to bed later. Now, melatonin is a soporific hormone, which means that it just signals your brain that you're ready to sleep. It is not a sleeping pill. We know that because in nocturnal animals, like for example mice, the secretion of melatonin leads to more activity. When it comes to light, there are two things you keep in mind. Number one, the lux is important. So the brighter, the better. 10,000 lux is better than 1,500. And also the wavelength is better. So blue-green light is very effective, more effective than white light in shifting your clock. So, you know, before I, I talk about the specific case studies, I do want to point out that the timing of this intervention is really, really important. Remember that team in I was showing you on that when your body temperature is at its minimum? That is the crossover zone. If you expose yourself to bright light here, you'll shift it, you go to bed earlier. Here you shift, you go to bed later. So let me give you an example to explain this. If you're a night owl, one of the people who raise their hands and go to bed at two in the morning, and then you no, naturally wake up at 10. If you wake up at eight in the morning, which is morning for us, right, and expose yourself to bright light, that will fall on the wrong direction and you will actually make things worse. 
So, this, so the timing is really, really important and really depends upon your individual biological clock. Okay, so here is the first example. This is the first, um, this is the New Orleans Saints. They were traveling to London this year to play the Miami Dolphins. Game time is about 2.30 in the afternoon London time. They were going to play um, in North Carolina just before they left for the, uh, for the London trip. And they did have a bye week, which was good. So I, you know, I helped them with managing their jet lag. So remember, we're talking about biological clocks and not the local clock. So let me orient you here. This is not a 12, um, you know, the, the normal clock. You know, this is clock time in London, midnight, 6 in the morning, 12 noon, uh, 6 p.m. So your bedtime should be about 11 p.m. You should wake up about 7 in the morning. Kickoff is 2.30. When you come from New Orleans, your biological clock is synchronized with New Orleans time. So really, when you're trying to fall asleep at 11 p.m. London time, you're, you're, that's for you is about 4 to 5 p.m. New Orleans time. So that's really difficult to fall asleep because remember, you're, you're fighting against that peak in your circadian rhythm. Also, when you wake up at 7 in the morning, really it's between 1 and 2 in the morning for you. So it's really difficult. So in fact, um, you know, if you read in, in, in the, the media will say, newspapers will say, well, as soon as you get to a new place, expose yourself to really bright light because it'll help you acclimatize. Actually, not so in this case. In fact, you, you want to prevent light exposure till about 11 or noon when you first get to London because otherwise it's going to phase delay you. So in fact, one of the interventions we had is we had all of them wear UV blocking sunglasses till about noon London time for the first three days. They were also given melatonin uh, on a scheduled dose. They were offered um, melatonin sourced from a compounding pharmacy and this was done under the supervision of their team physician. Okay, so you know when you when you do this in the sleep lab and you use light or melatonin to shift your clock, you're 100% effective because that's in a controlled environment. But here, you know, th this is a team of people; they have different um, biological clocks. Plus, you know, there's so many variables. They're on a flight. There may be exposure to light. So really, a comprehensive program was drawn out in which specific instructions were given in an attempt to control the environment as much as possible. So for example, pre-flight, you know, if there were, there were severe night owls and morning people in there and they were given slightly separate, different set of instructions. Also, they were told while in the United States to bank as much sleep as possible, right? So if I knew I was going to be in, on call in three days time, the worst thing I can do is to get less sleep now. You know, I, I should bank sleep in preparation of the fact that there will be a time when I'm going to get less sleep. Um, also, while they were in the flight, the first thing they were instructed to do is to shift, change their uh, watches and to set them to London time and now live. So eat and sleep as if you're already on London time, which meant they'd have to eat early on the flight and spend the, most of the flight sleeping, in, uh, especially in the, the first part of the flight the flight. Uh, the plane was kept darkened. They were, they were told to use, um, you know, there were uh, neck pillows, eye mask, um, noise canceling headphones, not allowed to use electronics, um, um, instructed to sleep, and also, if you can't fall asleep, to practice body-mind rest, which is, you know, stay in bed. Don't start, don't get up and start playing cards with each other or, or uh, you know, uh, talking too much. And they were instructed to put on those sunglasses prior to in disembarkment till about um, 11 to noon or noon the next day. And the, the first day they were there, as and the first few days, we were strict about their bedtime. So don't take a nap until your actual bedtime. Don't exercise too close to your bedtime. Don't drink too much caffeine close to your bedtime. Um, and to keep your bedroom cold and dark and, you know, try to make sure that you get enough sleep. So typically, it takes about one day per time zone to get acclimatized. When you do specific in, in interventions, um, you, can, you can shift your clock you know, two time zones in one day. And so then, then the team gets enough time to, you know, to train and prepare for the next game, et cetera. And they, they did beat the Dolphins. So you know, as a sleep doctor, my goal was to make sure that they, they um, number one, 
get, you know, sleep better, and also uh, feel more refreshed. And, and that's the feedback we got, that the players, they did, and the team, did sleep better and feel, you know, more refreshed the next day. So the next example I, I want to talk about is um, an East Coast Major League Baseball uh, team that, um, I, uh, that went to the West Coast. And um, without spending much time on this slide, really, uh, what I, I want to give you this example because this was a time when we tried to align their peak, peak performance time to the actual game time. Right, and the people who work in major, major League Baseball will understand this. So when you're going from the East Coast to the West Coast, you know, players typically go to bed between two and, well, between one and three in the morning. But when you go from the East Coast, um, you know, the bed, it's not difficult to go to bed late. So delaying your bedtime is really not the issue. The issue is the game time. So your game time begins at 7 p.m. local time, which is really 10 p.m for somebody who's coming from the East Coast. And so, you know, you're already at a biological disadvantage. So the, again, the, the, you know, the instructions are really simple. First of all, you know, education, to explain to them why, why this is important. And uh, make sure you get enough sleep while you're on the East Coast. Also, you can actually shift your clock to the West Coast time prior to even getting there. That's simple to do and easy to do if you have, you have a string of night games. Um, it would also mean canceling the morning practice if you have a day game prior to you, to you flying there. And then they were given, um, you know, some of the players used light boxes as well as caffeine prior to the game time so they had enough energy um, before playing. The next, um, one more example I'm going to give here is this West Coast NBA team who was coming to the East Coast to play. And the reason I want to bring this up is because we instructed them to do nothing, to not not shift their clocks, and I'll explain to you why here. So when you, when you come to the East Coast, you know, players go to bed between one and three in the morning, and uh, game times are about 7 p.m. local time. So when you come from the West Coast, the first thing is, uh, so the chief athletic trainer said, well, you know, my players are not gonna go to bed early. They really cannot wind down and fall asleep at 11 p.m. That's really, really difficult for them. Also, they were going to go to, um, they were going to Atlanta, then Miami, then San Antonio before they went back. And nobody goes to bed early in Miami. So even if I made, you know, gave them any uh, suggestions, they were not going to. So, so actually we suggested that when they come, they stay on West Coast time. You know, go to bed at about four in the morning, but sleep in. That meant no morning practices. So get enough sleep there. The one change we did is that most times teams will back up immediately after the game, get on a flight and take a red eye, and we instructed them to spend the night while on the West Coast, get enough sleep, and then take the flight to come into the East Coast. So, you know, before I end, I wanna talk about that, um, the common cold. You know, I have, I've been talking about the effect of your biological clock has on your performance, but in fact, your biological clock, remember, affects every every physiological function. So in fact, your, your cells, the, your immune cells that fight infection have a circadian rhythm to it. So when you're jet lagged and you're going to a different time zone, that's out of sync. Plus we know that sleep deprivation increases, uh, decreases your immunity and makes you sicker. So you could in fact, if you don't treat jet lag, you could in fact be more susceptible to the common cold and not perform at your at your level best. So to summarize, I, I hope I've shown you that your circadian rhythms affect every physiological function and thus are key to peak performance. And that manipulating your biological clock can be done. I think, you know, in a, in a world where we are looking to maximize the edge and utilize everything, um, this aspect is under-recognized and um, um, often unknown, not unexplored. Also, um, you know, being, like I said last time, in, last year, being an athlete is a 24-hour profession. It's not just what you do when you're on the field or in your training room. Um, getting enough sleep and doing it on a regular basis is important. And really, giving athletes tools to, which will help them in winding down. You know, things like meditation or mindfulness are, are really important and often ignored. Okay, with that,
Thank you very much. Uh, I want to acknowledge I, I work with a fantastic group of people, Dr. Thomas Roth, uh, Dr. Christopher Drake. They're um, researchers that I work with. There's also a, a small but really uh, smart community of sleep scientists who uh, work with athletes. And um, here's my information. There's you know, often a lot of misinformation about sleep as well as your biological rhythms. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. And thank you for coming, even if it was in the afternoon.